Well, good evening and welcome to our first uh, service of our communion weekend here in Hilton. Uh, tonight we have Reverend Ian McCaskill, no stranger to you, who will uh, lead our service this evening. And afterwards we have a fellowship through in the hall, so please uh, stay for that if you can. And Ian will share with us a little of the Lord's work in his own life uh, up until now and even the work that he's involved in uh, just now as well. Uh, tomorrow morning, communion will be served here in Hilton. Uh, Reverend Jeremy Ross will be uh, leading our services tomorrow. Uh, Jeremy, who's just become the CEO of Blycewood, who was here just a month or so ago on a Wednesday. Uh, Jeremy will be leading our communion services tomorrow. So the Kirk session uh, will be open uh, right after the evening, this evening's service. So if there is anyone who would like to profess their faith in the Lord Jesus for the first time, uh, then you're most welcome to uh, come and speak uh, with any of us after the service. And so therefore, uh, the elders who are here would be good if uh, you're able just to wait behind at uh, the benediction tonight as we have this short Kirk Session meeting. Thank you, Andrew. So both myself and Andrew are suffering from a, a bad cold, so um, sorry about, about that. I'm a bit croaky, but hopefully we'll get through the two hours we're together tonight. <laughs> uh, we're going to sing, first of all, in Psalm 25, Psalm 25 in the Sing Psalms, and uh, we're going to sing verses 4 to 9. O Lord, reveal to me your ways, and all your paths help me to know. Direct and guide me in your truth, instruct me in the way to go. You are my Saviour and my God all day, I hope in you alone. Remember, Lord, your love and grace, which from past ages you have shown. Do not recall my sins of youth or, or my rebellious evil ways. Remember me in your great love. For you, O Lord, are good always. Because the Lord is just and good, he shows his path to all who stray. He guides the meek in what is right and teaches them his holy way. So we'll sing these verses, Psalm 25, and the sing psalms to God's place. Oh. Uh -huh. 
So let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love singing uh, the psalms. We love singing the words of the psalm uh, before us this evening. And Lord, as uh, your people prepare to um, sit at the Lord's table on the Lord's day, Lord, it is with um, great thanks, Lord, that we we can sit and come into communion with, with you, our God. And we thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice for sin, for Jesus Christ, uh, the righteous one, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. So we thank you that you are a good God, that you're a God of love and grace and mercy, and Lord, that you would reveal to us your ways and that you would direct us in your truth always and that you would instruct us in the way that we should go. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all those people here and it gives great delight for us to see uh, the children as well, Lord. Bless them. We thank you for them. And we pray that they would uh, grow up as uh, men and women who will be trusting in you as Saviour and Lord. And we would pray even this day, Lord, for Caleb Ian. Uh, bless him. Uh, bless his family. Bless his parents. And Lord, that he would grow up to be a Caleb himself. And Lord, in this day and generation, we so need people to stand up for Jesus. Where there are so many uh, voices calling our young people here, there, and everywhere. Lord, that they would hear the voice that says, come to me and be saved. We thank you for those of us tonight who have heard your voice and have responded to it and now can be called children of God, for that is who we are and that's what we are. And we pray too, Lord, for any tonight that may not know, know you. We pray that this would be the day that they would profess uh, your, your name and even some who might be yours, Lord, who have not yet professed your name publicly, that they would do so because you have extended uh, your grace and mercy towards each one of us. Uh, Lord, we are all invited, and we thank you that one day those who have accepted you will sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb and sit at the, the banqueting table where the banner over us uh, is love. So, Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us. And we pray, Lord, in this preparatory service that you would speak to us about anything that might be a blockage for us to be serving you better. Uh, Lord, that you would reveal um, yourself, but also, Lord, uh, show us ourselves. And, Lord, that we would come and confess our sin and that we would be uh, people who would remember, Lord, what you've done for us. Our prayer, Lord, is that you would not remember our sins, even our sins of youth and our rebellious, evil ways, that you would remember us in your great love because you are good always. So bless those who can't be here. We pray to Lord, for uh, Alistair in his sabbatical. Bless him. Uh, we pray, Lord, that he would have a time of blessing and bless the family. And bless the church family of Tain and Fern, Lord. We ask, Lord, that they would know your your power, your peace, your presence, and Lord, eh, your purpose and your plans for them. We ask, Lord, that we would be still now and know that you are God as we read your word to us. We thank you that your word is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. We pray that you'd speak to us all this evening, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to read God's word in the gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, and we're reading just at verse 21 at the bottom of page 985. Page 985, Matthew 18, at verse 21. So Matthew 18, and at verse 21, the parable of the unmerciful servant. 
Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Or, uh, the footnote says, or even 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began to, uh, the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. He begged and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And to his name we give all the praise and all the glory. And we'll sing to his praise and glory again before we look at that passage together. This time in Psalm 103, again in the Sing Psalms. And we're going to, we're going to sing from verse 1 to 14. So it's a, a long section. Psalm 103 of Sing Psalms on page 135. We're singing 1 to 14. Praise God, my soul, with all my heart. Let me exalt his holy name. Forget not all his benefits, his praise, my soul, in song proclaim. The Lord forgives you all your sins and heals your sickness and distress. Your life he rescues from the grave and crowns you in his tenderness. So 1 to 14 to God's praise.
let's turn back then to Matthew chapter 18 and look at this uh, parable together this evening. There's different subjects we could cover in a preparatory service of communion, but tonight we're going to consider the topic of forgiveness, and I suppose that's appropriate uh, for a preparatory service. And we'll do so in light of Peter's question to our Lord, how many times shall I forgive? Now, of course, Jesus had taught Peter and the other disciples to pray what we know as the Lord's Prayer. And part of that prayer is, forgive us our debts or our trespasses, as we also forgive those who trespass against us, or we forgive our debtors. And when Jesus taught his disciples uh, to pray, he concluded by saying, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But then he said, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father, your heavenly Father, understood, will not forgive your sins. Because Jesus had also commanded them, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So Peter knew then that he had to forgive. And probably like ourselves, he found that hard in certain situations, maybe with certain people, um, certain situations, sins done to us or sins done to other people, sometimes we find it very hard to forgive. So he questioned Jesus, seeking to see if there's a limit on the number of times he could or should forgive. But Peter had to learn a lesson, and we have to learn a lesson that forgiveness knows no bounds. So this evening, two headings, forgiveness first of all, and then unforgiveness. So Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? And then he goes, up to seven times? So Peter probably thought that he was being very generous in suggesting seven times because the teachers of the law, the Jewish rabbis, were, as far as they were concerned, it was only necessary maybe to forgive the same offense up to a maximum of, of three times. And maybe Peter thought that Jesus would commend him for going above three and not even four, but seven times. But as we said, Peter had a lot more to learn about forgiveness. So Jesus answered and he said, I tell you, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. It's not clear whether the Greek says 77 times or 70 times seven. But what is clear is that forgiveness has no limits. And to illustrate the point, Jesus presented this parable. Therefore, he said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, throughout this earthly ministry, Jesus often spoke about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And here, if we think of God as king or the master, we will understand the parable much better or uh, far more e easily. We will understand the meaning of the story. Jesus often told a story with a deeper spiritual meaning. That's why he often spoke in parables. As the, began, the king began to settle accounts, a man who owed him, um, a newer version of the NIV, NIV says, owed him 10,000 bags of gold. He owed him lots and lots of money. So this man was brought before the king. Now, there was no way that this man could pay back this vast amount of money that he owed. So maybe the, the, perhaps the king thought he could get something in return if he and his family were sold into slavery. So we read, since he was not able to pay, the, the master or the king ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay 
some of the debt. So some of you will be in business and it's quite sad when a company goes into liquidation and lots of people are left owing lots of money to varying degrees and it's really quite sad that sometimes you just get that much of what you're owed. And really this is the best that this master, this person could hope for because this is a huge debt this man had. At this, the servant fell on his knees before the king, pleading for mercy. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. And again, this is quite common in business. Someone will say, look, if you just give me an, another wee while, and especially going to banks, and then sadly sometimes the bank says, no, that's it. The plug is pulled, the business collapses, many people redundant, huge effect. But this man is begging, I will pay back everything. But again, it was impossible for him. But his cry for mercy and his deep plight produced his master having pity on him. And we read that his, his master cancelled the whole debt and let him go. Now it's not exactly the same, but I remember accompanying someone to court who had loads of charges against him. But in the time he had reformed his life, or rather Jesus had changed him because he had become a Christian. And he appeared before the judge in one of our local courts. And the judge was amazed that he was, what the Bible would say, in his right mind fully clothed. And he was sitting before the judge, or then standing before the judge. And the judge says, well, what's come over you? You've been used to seeing this man for years. And he says, well, I've become a Christian. And then the judge or the sheriff did something that he, he admitted he hadn't done at all in his career. He was about to retire. He adjourned and he met with the procurator fiscal and the different solicitors and lawyers. And he came out and he just said, look, I'm going to do something I've never done in my career as a sheriff. I'm going to wipe the slate clean. I'm going to give you a new start. And that man broke down afterwards and uh, phoned his daughter saying, I'm free. And I asked him, how long have you had charges against you? He said, well, I've, for the past 40 years, I've always had something hanging over me. But this was a new start. The slate had been wiped clean. The master, the king, cancelled the debt and let this man go. What an amazing outcome. Not only was the man set free, his wife was, his massive debt was completely cancelled, the slate was wiped clean, the burden of guilt was taken from his shoulders, he was a free man. And as you come to sit at the Lord's table, God willing, tomorrow. This is what God has done for you in Christ. He's taken your debt. He's taken the burden of your sin. You see, the Lord's prayer speaks of sin as a debt. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And sin is a debt for which the price has been paid. The penalty must be paid. And the good news is that Jesus Christ has paid it. He paid the debt to God. Jesus paid the price by dying on the cross of Calvary, shedding his blood so that you could be set free. 
And that's what you remember, the shed blood. The broken body. We are bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you know, on the cross, Jesus cried out, it is finished. Not I'm finished, <laughs> but it is finished. Tetelestai, one word in the Greek, which means the debt has been paid in full. Now at the time, again going back to business, where there's a transaction, if you owed someone money, you would bring an invoice or whatever, and if you went to, to one of the local businesses here, um, I'll just say Sangsters because... <laughs> And you presented your invoice, stamped, tetelestai, paid in full. So that's what was happening here when Jesus said, it is finished. The Bible says, God cancelled the record of debt that stood against us by nailing it to the cross. The record of debt that stood against us by nailing it to the cross. Jesus paid it all. <coughs> All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it. He washed it white as snow. Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. So yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Forgiveness. Unforgiveness, secondly. So surely the servant who had been owed so much would have been overwhelmed with gratitude, overwhelmed with Thanksgiving, but sadly, his actions and his attitude reveal something differently. Because we read together that after leaving the presence of his master, leaving the presence of the king, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a very, well, I suppose it was significant, but tiny compared with the debt that he had had and been cleared by his master. So he met this man who owed him something. Yes, significant, but nothing in comparison, as we said. And considering what he himself had experienced, his response was shock shocking because we read there that he grabbed his fellow servant, he began to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe me. Now, this poor man fell on his knees and begged, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Now, notice, these are the very same words that the first servant had used himself, that he had uttered to his master, to his king, when he was begging for mercy. But whereas he had been forgiven his enormous debt, he refused to forgive his fellow servant. He showed no mercy at all. Instead, he went off and got the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. So his actions then reveal the true condition of his heart. Instead of being filled with love and compassion and thankfulness for the forgiveness that he himself had experienced, he was full of rage. He was full of anger. These traits reveal an unforgiving heart. So what about you then, as you hope to sit at the Lord's table tomorrow? Is there unforgiveness lurking in your heart? Because if it is, or if there is, it will manifest itself in your actions and your attitudes. The Bible says, get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all rage and malice and anger and brawling 
and slander. Get rid of it. But rather be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now the Bible speaks of a woman of ill repute, you know the story yourselves, who knelt before Jesus and washed his feet with her tears. And Jesus said of her, she who has been forgiven much, loves much. So friends, this evening, all of us need to realize the extent of our sin against a holy God. And those of us who have come to Jesus for forgiveness really need to understand how much we have been forgiven. We are like this servant who owed a huge amount that we could never pay back ourselves. And the reason that this is important is because it is only when we appreciate our forgiveness and what we have been forgiven that we can truly forgive others from the heart. You see, there are situations and there are people that cause us to find it difficult to forgive. But bitterness and rage and anger hold us back in our Christian walk. And we need to repent of that. You see, anger and hatred come out of us and we target those we refuse to forgive. And in this way, we hurt them. And sometimes we're happy when we hurt them. But friends, listen. Bitterness is internal. If you allow bitterness and an unforgiving heart and unforgiveness to take root in your heart, then that will eat away at you. And it will keep eating away at you. And the only person it hurts is you. The only person who suffers is you. Now, we covered this recently in one of our trauma healing groups, and there were so many people who had so many situations that were really hard to forgive. And they would admit that this unforgiveness caused them physical, spiritual, emotional anguish. This is so important. What can you do? What can I do? What can we do? Well, we make up our mind to forgive. You see, forgiveness takes one person. Reconciliation takes two. You can forgive and you can only reconcile when the other person comes to meet you. Think of Jesus hanging on a cross, crucified by the people he came to save, his own people. What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So today, you can choose to forgive. Now, you can forgive, and sometimes you need to forgive and forgive and forgive. But you need to forgive until you finally put the matter to rest. Then you will be able to love your enemies. 
And then you will be able to pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Because this is the work of God's grace. God's amazing grace. Then your chains of bitterness and rage and anger will be gone. You'll be set free. Speaking to someone recently who told her of a, a tough upbringing. Um, his father was made redundant before his retirement age. Um, very poor family. So his dad thought, well, if I could maybe fix a few cars for, for a few people, that would get, get us some money to feed the family. And that was going fine until the neighbor, this lady, complained to the council, and the council stopped it all. And the income went. And this man, the son of the man who was fixing the cars, he said, I hated that woman. Because I saw what she did to us as a family, to what she did to my father. It broke him. He was redundant. He wanted to work. He couldn't get a job. He was too old. And he was only fixing a few cars for a few friends. No big deal. I hated that woman with a passion. But then he said, I ended up living in that house when my father passed away. And that woman was my neighbor. And I became a Christian. <laughs> and the Bible says, love your, love your neighbor. I hated her. <laughs> because of what she had done to those I loved. He says, but I saw her trying to weed her garden one day. And I don't know how I did it, but I went and I... I weeded her garden for her. And I've been doing it ever since. She's now an old lady. And I love her. That's grace. That's God's grace. Remember what Jesus said, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So we can't be like the unforgiving servant. Because Jesus went on, and this is very solemn. If you do not forgive others their sins, your Father, your Heavenly Father, will not forgive your sins. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they reported back to the master, the king. And then the master called the wicked servant and he said, I cancelled all your debt because you begged me to. Should you not have shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I have had shown mercy on you? And in his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Though shown great mercy, the servant refused the example of the king. The servant had been spared punishment by the king the first time. Now he faced the king's judgment. And Jesus concludes the parable with these solemn words. This is how my heavenly father will treat, treat each one of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Can we summarize? It is only when you realize that you're a poor, wretched sinner that you will truly appreciate the forgiveness of God the character of God that we've been singing about in Psalm 25 and Psalm 103, full of grace and compassion, mercy, slow to anger, patience. That's our God. And that's a picture we've got of God here.
I'm often used to illustration, you know, if we just think one bad thing, do one bad thing, say one bad thing. You know, today I've sinned three times. I've said something bad to Andrew. I've thought something bad to that Rod. I've done something bad to Mary. Three sins. End of the week, 21. End of the month, 84. End of the year, a thousand. And if I live three score and ten, I've sinned 70,000 times. And I go to God. God loves me, he hates my sin. And you know, tonight, if, as you've seen in Christianity Explored, if these walls were white and your sin, your sins of youth, your rebellion, all the things you've done against people, against parents, against different people, against God, were up on the wall. You would be ashamed. You would cringe. And so would I. Cringe if my sins were up on the wall. But you know, God has cancelled them. God has wiped the slate clean. God has chosen to cast them into the sea of his forgetfulness. So why, why, why are you holding any bitterness against anyone for anything they might have done to you? Now, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not saying your situation isn't difficult. But we have to forgive. And even in churches, we have to forgive so much Arctic to our Father in Heaven, the way we behave to one another as brothers and sisters. It's awful. And sometimes the church courts are the worst places where those of us who have been called to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ just don't show Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. So you can come again, or you can come the first time and cry out. Lord, have mercy. Lord, remember me. And he will cancel your debt. Father, forgive them. He is mighty to save. He can move the mountain of sin from your life. And he says to you tonight again, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So come to the cross. Come to the table. Appreciating the sacrifice that has been made for your sin. Where you can say, he loved me and he gave himself for me. One final illustration of grace. We had a man called Eddie Murison. Some of you might have heard him. Some of you might have read his book. Speaking in Stirling when we were there a couple of years ago. And you know, he had been wild. He had caused havoc to so many people. In fact, he set his school on fire up there in Dornock when he was fostered out. And many years later, he spoke at the Dornock Fellowship and he met this older lady <coughs> who was his head teacher. And she said, Eddie Murison, you put my school on fire. <laughs> you give me a nervous breakdown. But I never stopped praying for you. 
And that same Eddie Murison was speaking at Stirling Free Church one evening. And he said his biggest regret is the havoc he caused to prison officers when he was being taken from prison to prison. He said, I was like a wild animal. And he went to the head of one of the prisons, I think it was Perth, to ask for forgiveness when he became a Christian. And the head of the prison department said to him, I will never forgive you. And sadly, that man took his own life a month later. So Eddie was publicly asking forgiveness for all the people he had hurt in the prison service. And as he was finishing, this man who had come into the meeting last minute, none of us knew him, stood up. And he said, Eddie Murison, I was a prison officer in Glen Ochel. And we treated you like an animal. We goaded you. We kicked you. We did all things, all sorts of things to you. But now I am a Christian. I'm your brother in Christ. And I want to, on behalf of my fellow prison officers, ask you for forgiveness for the way that we treated you. He walked towards the pulpit, the lectern, and he and Eddie hugged. And that was the best visual, verbal illustration of grace that I'd have ever seen or heard. Nothing is impossible for God. So if God has spoken to you about forgiveness tonight, he certainly has spoken to me as I've prepared this message. Let's forgive, let's forget, and let's move on in the work of the gospel. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you are a forgiving God. You don't remember our sins of youth or our sins of today, but you've chosen to forgive us, Lord, in your mercy in your grace and in your goodness. Lord, none of us could stand if you were to mark iniquity against us. But yet with thee there is forgiveness so that we fear you, Lord. So we pray, Lord, that you'd bless us all. Bless your lovely people here, Lord, who will sit and remember the sacrifice made for them. In their act of remembrance, Lord, I say, drink the cup and break the bread. May they really, truly see what you have done for them. And Lord, if there's any here tonight that you've spoken to who have not yet made that public profession, Lord, this is the day and we will rejoice over one sinner who repents because we know that there is rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents on earth. So bless us all. Bless our families. Bless this church family, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's sing in conclusion Psalm 130 from the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 130 from the Scottish Psalter on page 421. Lord, from the depth to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, do thou hear. And to my supplication voice, give an attentive ear. Lord, who shall stand? If thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, but yet with thee forgiveness is that feared thou mayest be. The whole psalm we stand to sing.
pray now for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, to rest and remain with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>